power. Xander starts a little bit early so that we can deal with that as well when we get over and start up our uh, little clickety clack here. Here's our opening logo, Troubles in Paradise. Typewriters, remember typewriters? Analog clocks, remember analog clocks? Isn't that exciting? And there's our Troubles in Paradise logo, and we will stop the sharing for the moment. And we are kind of starting up here. Then later on, kind of in the middle of the show, I'll probably try to set up uh, Peter's commercial which I can run as well. We'll see whether or not as anybody actually starts showing up in the show in advance. Um, it's been a busy time here in Spokane. Uh, plans to be together with family on Thanksgiving have disappeared as a consequence of the uh, resurgence of COVID, which everybody that knows anything at all about it knows was going to happen because our F up president of the United States couldn't get his act together and wanted all the states to do this independently. And a bunch of Republicans in particular didn't like the idea of infringing on people's rights to spread a pandemic like during a pandemic. So we're in a, um, a murky little thing. But as uh, one uh, uh, quipster put it on Twitter, uh, better uh, a Zoom Thanksgiving than an ICU Christmas. Oh, that's something to consider. Um, there's still about eight or nine minutes before the actual official part of the show, and we'll see. Yeah, hell, I feel like keeping my glasses on. Just live with the reflection. Ah, Josiah, hello, fellow pheasants. Hello there. Let me type in there. Hi, Josiah. Oh, um, as I said, I started up the show just a mite early uh, to make sure we had some kind of idea of uh, what was going on uh, and make sure connections. There was a little bit of a squeeziness on the connection happening. Let me see if I can remind everybody that there is the rocks were there and there is evolution slam dunk and there is Paralogs of Phileas Fogg's book, which I'm currently working on the uh, second uh, volume of that and amongst other things. And that keeps my brain from frying late at night as I venture forth into the 1870s. Uh, we still got about eight minutes to go then until the actual official beginning of the show. Hope everybody out in Zoom land is uh, staying safe and careful. Um, oh, Jose, my name was said, oh, the dopamine stuff, that's the stuff, yeah. A sudden reference that, that you only exist when you're on uh, on uh, YouTube. I mean, let's just admit it. Or as um, the character says uh, in um, Fahrenheit 451, uh, you know, your whole world opens up when you get your second wall screen. But um, it is a way, at least unlike previous pandemics, when people were be in complete isolation, uh, we got um, Ozymorph. Uh, we've got um, the ability to communicate in ways that we couldn't do before, and we have all that internet-y stuff, so I can continue to do research on my projects. I went from somebody who spends a lot of time on the computer in my den to somebody who spends a lot of time on my computer in my den. <laughs> the, uh, the quarantine world really doesn't affect all that much, and um, at least uh, up until recently, uh, we were opening up the state more and more. The problem is our next door neighbors over in Idaho were just acting like what COVID and now uh, things are murking up on our end, uh, end of the thing. The Spokane is just across the border from Idaho. Uh, so um, the, the amount of cases are rising and people are worried about how hospitals are going. There are cases in some states of where somebody needs an elective surgery and sorry, but all the beds are taken. That's the problem with uh, COVID spreading willy-nilly. It's not that the death rate is excessively large, it's worse than flu, but less than the 1918 pandemic. But if enough people have it, you're completely overtaxing your hospital system. Wise up, kids. Uh, uh, bear that in mind, uh, that um, you, it, there's, not, there's a finite number of hospital beds, there's a finite number of doctors, there's a finite number of um, ICUs and the like, and this can easily balloon out of uh, all proportion very quickly if it can spread fast enough. So everybody, rise up, settle down, be calm, proceed normally, and 
pay attention to what's coming out of President-elect Biden's uh, press announcements and not what is the nothing happening over in um, President Trumpster, who um, was asleep at the switch before and continues to be asleep at the switch, still trying to fume his way through uh, the Electoral College uh, without much to Apparently, they're spending $3 million on a recount of some selected Wisconsin things, not the full $8 million needed to count the whole bloody state. Uh, not needless to say, there's no evidence that Trump, the alleged billionaire, is actually ponying up any money out of this. This is presumably coming from that slush fund uh, that uh, people have been donating on it, although I haven't seen any indication of well, how much they're actually pulling in on that. Every time Team Trump does any tweets on the subject, you know, um, I say, hey, how, how, how much money you got coming in there? We, is that a state secret? Anyway, uh, so I, I try to make my life miserable for um, um, the various Trumpistas out there because they deserve it. That's what I can say. So uh, we're getting close enough to the hour. We can kind of launch into the actual uh, discussions of stuff. Um, as most of you who know, um, if you're a, a, a regular viewer of, of my mug, uh, you know that what I've been doing is a source analysis on replacing Darwin, uh, Daniel Jensen's creation of Screed that was um, sent to me as the next stage in uh, source analysis. Uh, if you try looking in the back of the book, which is a thin little book compared to my gigantic one, you'll find there's no index, there's no reference bibliography, uh, there are footnotes, but have you ever tried to find out quick whether uh, somebody has cited a work when you don't have an index or a bibliography? And the answer is no. You'll have to plow through footnote on footnote on footnote to try to locate what, whether that particular work has been cited or not. So. Um, basics of source methods is remedy that. They're running, uh, at the moment, he's going at about one source per page, which is pretty thin. So we're here about 115 pages in, and he's only got about that many sources. Uh, some of them, a, a big chunk of them are secondary, and of the technical literature that he's brought up so far, he's misrepresenting stuff, leaving material out, and so forth. At the moment, he's in the uh, biogeography chapter, which I've been waiting for for quite some time. And this has been hit on by a variety of critics um, of um, him so far. Uh, Dan Sturden uh, Cardinale and uh, Ivo Grad and others have went into uh, varying uh, technical aspects of Jensen's book. And in due course, as relevant, I'll be thinking to that material. Uh, but um, I'm just approaching this right from that core basement, which is makes a claim. What does he use to document it? Does the source documentation match up? Does the source documentation discuss stuff that should have been brought up but isn't? And that's where we are this episode. Uh, because um, he's uh, going on this time uh, around page uh, 114 about uh, orangutans and gibbon uh, distribution. Well, that's right up that's it, given Erica's uh, territory. So if you're catching this at some point, Erica, uh, your name is not being taken in vain. And all of Jensen's data field, what little he is presenting, relates to the current distribution of gibbons, where they are found now, zip on their fossil representation. Well, is there a fossil representation for orangutans and the like? Yeah. And um, I'll be uh, putting up linkages um, in due course to a 2013 paper uh, by Ibrahim on uh, some Malaysian finds, uh, the detail of their biogeography of half a million years ago. Oh, that's past his 6,000 year time frame. And then a 2018 paper by Spare, which of course dates after uh, Jensen's book by a year, that shows the current distribution is just a restricted niche of their former range and neither of which is anywhere near Mount Ararat. Uh, it extends up into um, Southeast Asia and into China. And uh, that one is from Science Magazine, uh, Science Advances. And then there's also the funky stuff that um, orangutans had speciated fairly recently. The current species is about as contemporary as ours, about two, three 300,000 years. And so there's a 2011 paper by Holbalt on that that I'll be putting a link to. Uh, and um, Meanwhile, uh, Ken Am's Ark Encounter, bless its heart, 
He is seriously trying to cram all of that primate evolution along with hominids uh, into just a post-flood dispersal. So gibbons, orangutans, australopithecines, all of that supposedly are degenerating from the created kind um, in um, uh, the post-flood period. And uh, Joel uh, Duff did a delicious post on that from back in May that I'll be putting a link up at his uh, naturalhistorian.com site, uh, which by the way, if you're not subscribed to that and all of that, which you can do to get notifications about new, uh, get on their email list, uh, that's something relevant to deal with. Uh, Duff is uh, um, a um, very deft follower of that speciation biogeography issue for going back for years, in addition to stuff on geology and other aspects of young earth creationists that he finds <laughs> legitimately preposterous. And um, uh, Jackson and I had already tracked some of the same issues on uh, the Ark Encounter and what their kinds are uh, it, for our own work. But uh, Joel Duff had done some really spectacular work on this where he was analyzing why their treatment of horses and, and, and okapis and a, a bunch of other stuff was just claptrap wrong. And uh, it's well worth the, uh, the non-price of admission to go over there and look at his material. There's, there's an awful lot of very deaf uh, researchers. Uh, Darren Nash is another one to follow, uh, uh, the, uh, I think, Laylops uh, blog. Uh, Carl Zimmer um, is another excellent one. Uh, Josiah says, sometimes I think I'm almost feeling bad for Kent Ham. Uh, usually just turns out to be gas, though. Yeah. Uh, I have to confess that there is nothing that I've ever observed in Ken Ham that would prompt me to feel sorry for him. Um, he's a superficial, arrogant jerk who um, is so ignorant of his own side's argument that you can frequently find Ken Ham making statements on his daily blogs that don't even match up with what his own journals and, and resources argue. I don't think Ken, uh, Ken pays that much attention to what goes on in Answers and Genesis. Uh, he uh, pops up. You can see him skewered by uh, Apologia uh, frequently in his ham and eggs, ham and eggs uh, that he does uh, periodically, uh, where he'll show up like the great oracle, uh, along with uh, Georgia Purdom and Buddy Hodge, who are the main hosts. Uh, they've got enough scratch, you know, to do fairly sophisticated graphics and all of that. The publications that you get at Answers in Genesis. Uh, one nice thing about scholarly analysis from our current world is that unlike um, when I was starting in research on this in the 1980s and 90s, where an awful lot of the creationist stuff was only available to the creationists. You would have to buy their book or you would have to uh, uh, somehow or other get copies of their uh, creationist papers in various journals. Now, uh, the vast majority of the stuff is available online. That's some they posted it up so you can actually get at it, download it, research it at your leisure at no cost. And uh, at the very least, that's one saving grace about this, that if you want to research creationism, uh, don't spend any money on it, at least not for them. You know, if you're buying regular science books, then by all means, that's not a problem. But if you're, uh, don't shell out money uh, that's going to go into their coffers if you can avoid it. And fortunately, the vast majority of, of uh, arguments uh, at least in modern apologetics, is basically online based. Uh, this is a more complicated issue if you're an old fart like me that goes into the history of the creationism. Because um, a lot of arguments, as anyone who has got uh, evolution slam dunk thing right there, um, evolution slam dunk on the reptile mammal transition, um, will know that a lot of the apologetics that I'm dealing with are not available online. Uh, intelligent design material on the reptile mammal transition, what little they have of it, is basically in books. And Dwayne Gish, who is one of the seminal figures in creationism, evolution, uh, the fossils still say no, uh, is not um, available anywhere that I know digitally. So um, uh, you have to acquire these things as physical hard copies. Uh, if you're not an antiquarian type, you probably don't need to go that route because virtually all of the arguments that you're going to be slamming into with creationism and intelligent design don't require you to know that background material. 
But if you are planning on being an historian of the field, then a lot of that stuff actually does measure. And uh, anybody that has accumulated um, any of the obscure books that are relevant to this, um, share them with people. Let them know about it. Uh, if you can even um, and uh, digitize some things, share some of the relevant pages in that uh, via shared PDFs. Uh, that stuff is relevant to try to get it out so people can document these things better and offer that historical context to see how a particular bad idea originated at one point and then has been mutating through time. If you read the Dynamania chapter uh, at my website, um, you can uh, see how Dwayne Gish's view on, say, the Archaeoraptor case, uh, not Archaeoraptor, Archaeopteryx and, and various uh, Mesozoic birds and that, a uh, Protoamis, Protoamis case, um, mutated over time from one book to the next as he tried to edge his bets and adjust things. And if you were coming at this cold and only seeing one version of Dwayne Gish, you might not realize how he was doing this little tap dance from one book to the next. Uh, and that's why it's an advantage having older versions and newer versions of things uh, that you get a different perspective on it. And you can see more about how the, the system evolves in there. Uh, so I only see um, uh, the ones who have posted so far, everybody that's in the uh, live chat, say hi, if you hadn't. So I let you know what's going. All I've got is the uh, chat window that's popping up in the restream uh, feed. I don't have the one that's on actually on YouTube. So if any of you want to have a a, a wrench. I'm afraid I'm not in a position to be able to give it to you that at the moment. Um, now, while I will be gibbering here, I'm going to try to set my video up for the um, the rocks commercial, uh, which the last time I tried this, I had a devil of a time. There we go. And I, I have already discovered that sound does not work on this, but that was true of the old YouTube, so it doesn't make any difference. And um, uh, somehow or other. There must be a better way to do that, but uh, we'll get that figured out. So theoretically, I'm sharing, about to share my window again. And I'm going to get back up into here, and let me go up to there. Let's put up its commercial. Yay! It looks like it's there. And then we will. It has some jaunty music, which you cannot hear. There is the book. The rocks are there. The Jackson Weed and I have written. And um, there are some nice um, summary material and the Amazon ratings. It's um, a work that Jackson and I are very proud of. Um, some quotes from various um, great reviews of people that have enjoyed it. Systematic answer to the unscientific nonsense of creationism. P. Bauman, geologist, friend of the channel. Very thorough rebuttal of young earth creationist and presentation of the current evidence. And uh, we proceed uh, accordingly. Uh, Tom McDonald, a lot of people have followed our work over various years and, and we are building our network of uh, folk. And so it is definitely a book. And uh, the uh, the linkage, you, that won't work, you buy it now on Amazon, but uh, I will, as always, put the linkage of the, um, Thanks to the both of uh, Slam Dunk and uh, the other book, uh, Rocks Were There, and Volume 2 when that pops up. Um, Josiah looks good, but I already got mine, so I'm probably not the target for a commercial. Well, anybody that watches it at various points, uh, as uh, the audience kind of flits around, that commercial will be in there. And I like to have that uh, element. And, of course, that way they connect up with the fact that in the video description, I always put the linkage in so that they can get the book whenever they wish. Uh, Jackson and I will be diving into volume two um, come the new year, and uh, that one will be a really fun thing because there was an awful lot of topics that we touch upon in, in tiptoe manner, origin of tetrapods, really much greater detail on human evolution. Uh, there's more on flood geology, uh, both in terms of the Grand Canyon. Oh, we got a lot of stuff on that. Uh, and also the mythology underlying the flood stories and how this connects up with the uh, creationist uh, ideology. And so there, there's an awful lot of stuff that's um, uh, going to be in volume two, as well as an introductory chapter that will reprise what was in volume one and give some updates for new technical literature that has popped up since we published the book that are relevant to the point of issue. So all the point 
Uh, thanks, Josiah. Uh, uh, Peter is, does really nifty work. He did my opening logo things, and he did the uh, one for Jackson Wee. He's got a good visual sense. It's very, uh, very nice looking material, and it's a delightful advantage of not having cost a dime. Uh, that, that it was all free pro bono work on that. He, um, being a uh, obscure scholar in the middle of nowhere, that's that's doing all of this stuff um, as best I can, and on the resources that I have available. Uh, hell, can you imagine what we could be doing if we had the budget of answers in Genesis? Holy moly! Woo! There'd be no stopping us. Wow! The books you could do and the, the high quality production values and all that stuff. And so when you think about the money that is just flushed down the toilet of stupid uh, by um, um, answers in Genesis, they, uh, you don't really find quite the same thing in intelligent design. They don't they actually are not nearly as aggressive uh, at the Discovery Institute. It's possible they don't have nearly as much money to throw around. And then, of course, you've got little baby kids down at the Kent Hogan level, you know, that, that's basically running off of the volunteer assistance. Uh, and uh, he does effectively daily shows. Um, I, I, I would find it very annoying to have to scrape together um, uh, content other than if I were just getting up and snarking at creationists every single day which would be the equivalent of what Ken Hogan does up on his channel. And then you've got the flock of below bottom feeder levels, the standing for truths and Nephilim freeze and that, their brain trust and that, where they can go on for hours and hours of just wheel spinning repetition. That uh, doesn't really help me. I, I prefer to have a focused issue. And uh, so the idea of, of dealing with a particular episode that I can catch up on what was going on and uh, discuss uh, relevant material in a side topic and then uh, react to the current world, and uh, people can proceed accordingly. Uh, let me also uh, stop in, and uh, although we are still well from the midpoint of the show, uh, just in case live streaming screws up, let me thank our patrons. And there is, of course, a link to the patron account as well for anybody that wants to join the parade. And I'm well aware of the fact that given how tense everything is financially for everybody, um, I am so grateful that everybody that has stuck out and helped the project and continues to help the project, um, that's uh, very gratifying to me as, as a little scholar because there's no, nothing in the book of the universe that says people have to shell out money to just every Tom, Dick, and Harry on video just because they say a nice thing. Um, that's not how it works. So uh, our patrons, we have our colleagues level, uh, Hendrel, Eric Rowley, Speed of Sound, Cirrus, and Zeshi. We got our research level, Travis Adams, Ian Chan, oh dear Ian, he's all over the place. Convert me, uh, Stephen Early, Eat Neal, James Fitzwater, History Miner, Ralph McFadden, Apologia, uh, and Benjamin Simpson. We got our assistant researchers, Doranku, Totus Real, Christopher Johnson. We got our friends, Daniel, Steve Bauman, geologist, uh, Marigale Beddoes, Insects Are Cooled, Evan Miranda Reeves, Morton Nielsen, Paul the Skeptic, Paul Epicus, Bo Hobo, Rasmussen, Alex Stone, and Paul Williams. And I will always thank the legacy patrons, ones who were able to help in one form or another, but uh, uh, weren't able to do so on a continuing basis. Jen, Jody, Mike, John, Keith, Andrew, Dyer, Yui, uh, Mona, Brad, Daniel, Nanya, Staggles, Sun Skystone, Ugly Truman, Truth, Everett, and Sewer. Um, every one of you is uh, greatly appreciated. There's, I got a notification from Patreon that there is a procedure theoretically to have ones that, that are patrons who want to be charged for an entire year's supply at once. And um, I tried to get that going, but there was a menu that was snagging up on it. So I, it may be just a foible of things. Uh, so at the, it wouldn't affect anybody that's already a patron. And so at the moment, I'm just kind of holding that and keeping the system as it's going. Uh, there were also some issues uh, that they put through about um, tax deductions and various things that didn't really apply to the level that I was operating at because I'm not in the big bucks category. And so there we go. Uh, oh, as, as Zemorph says, I recently realized that Trumpists are even worse than flat earthers. Their dilution is scarily robust. That is um, uh, a surprisingly true statement. And it's more true than you might even think. Obviously, at the methodological level, uh, they're just as intractable, but they bump into that creationism frame because uh, the creationists are largely Trumpistas. So if you just think about somebody who has a brain that can easily doubt that the earth is 
a sphere, or that there were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark, or that the moon landing is a hoax, or fill in the blank of what they are bad at thinking about. Do you think they're going to be really careful and methodical and real when it comes to their pol political judgments? No. They're basically in the same boat in terms of relying on secondary sources that they don't fact check and having no standards for changing their mind, uh, a great tendency to repeat um, mantras and not around here. Uh, the same dynamic is going on. The content will vary in terms of the upper level of the object of desire that they want, but the bottom level up in terms of their bad source methods uh, is exactly the same. So if you, uh, if anybody that follows me on Twitter will notice that I apply the same standard to everybody. So I'm asking for evidence. If people ask me for evidence, I give it. Uh, I can explain why I believe what I do. Um, I target my um, uh, critical analyses from a source methods direction. And it's usually boiling down to knowing what their frame is, whatever that is, what they're leaving out, what their brains don't deal with because their primary source base doesn't discuss it either. So whether it's a Trumpista, I like to bring up um, Roy Cohen. If you're un I will type that into the live chat here. Uh, Roy Cohen. If you are somebody who wants to be critical of Donald Trump and um, look up Roy Cohen, if you don't know the history of that troll, that vicious, vile slug who was a uh, Joe McCarthy era um, guy who kept going and retooled himself as a lawyer of choice for people who wanted to defend the undefendable. And uh, he was a, a nasty uh, fellow who really helped train Trump in the full out bullshit mode. When you never admit to error, never admit to being wrong, uh, just lie if necessary. If you lose the case, you claim you won it. You just brazen it out. That was the mode that Roy Cohen really reinforced Donald Trump to do. And everything we see today in his refusal to accept uh, the outcome of the election is pure Roy Cohen. So I use hashtag Roy Cohen a lot on Twitter. It's almost a, it reflects a pathological hashtag Roy Cohen liar uh, in relation to Trump. And um, it's just the extreme kind of case as with creationists, how many of them really think there were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark versus how many of them are simply argumentatively contending that. Uh, you get in the same mode as to how much of Trump's claptrap does he actually even believe or how much of it is stuff that he is saying just for his own craven issue, that it doesn't matter whether he won the election. It's only important that his believers believe they won the election, and he will constantly reinforce that, and they'll never fact check it. And uh, it, such minds have always existed, will probably always exist to the end of time, but their effect has been magnified because they have a president of the United States that panders to them and fuels all of their most extreme viewpoints because it serves his own personal interest to do so. And that's why I hold him in such contempt, because it, uh, an honest ideologue that seriously believes the claptrap that they say um, is at one level somebody who doesn't even believe what they say and is simply doing it for a partisan personal gain is another matter. Uh, Vandalia says evidence? What for? Well, remember, though, um, Vandalia, that creationists are typical in that the vast majority of the professional ones really do offer, air quotes, evidence. They're up to their gunnels uh, with evidence. The question is, does it mean what they claim it does? Uh, is it simply reinforcing the stuff in-house that are other creationists, so they simply announce the thing that the other creationists did? And therefore, what you're talking about in evidence is when you can ground it in external sources. And that's where that source methods comes in, because it is an absolute universal tool that applies to all venues, uh, politics, science, history. I've mentioned before that 
uh, I come from a historical background, not a scientific background. And so I am more than aware that history is a trickier discipline to deal with than geology because the rocks don't do propaganda. Human scientists can have access to grind and overlook data, uh, but the rocks themselves, the data field itself, is not partisan. It doesn't care what you think about it, it just is. Whereas in history, human beings write memoirs that are uh, self-serving, uh, they can bullshit lie, uh, they can put up a great monument to a battle that they never won, uh, all that goes on. Hello, Vesta! Um, we, we, I started the show just a mite early, uh, just to make sure that we were on the, the show field. I um, spent the first uh, bit um, introducing the latest stupid of uh, our dear friend Jensen, uh, which is his uh, biogeographical non-claims about um, uh, orangutans and how he was leaving out the fossil data. And I'll be putting links into all that stuff once the show uh, gets in. Uh, part two is on our dear old friend, Ramat, a dear old friend in quotation marks, ironic because he is none of that. Uh, he's not old, he's not dear, and he's not a friend. Uh, Ramat uh, is associated with standing for truth. And if standing for truth is a very meticulous repeater of what a limited set of creationists insist is so, so he channels uh, Nathaniel Jensen, uh, Jeffrey Tompkins, uh, John Sanford, and so forth. Uh, Raw Matt is just a dervish of incompetent secondary citation. Uh, far, far more fluidly stupid than uh, standing for truth is at the narrow focus, parasitical stupid. And so one of the bits um, that um, uh, he had a paper, which I don't think is available online anymore. By the time I started uh, alluding to it, it had already been plugged because he was trying to imply that, well, he, he submitted it apparently to PLOS Biology, Public Library of Science Biology. There's not a snowball chance in hell that that would get published there. It's junk, and it's not even in the right format. Uh, and but he was sort of implying that the mere act of submitting it to them somehow was being published. Mm, it doesn't work that way. So that kind of blew up in his face, and he pulled. Uh, even though the PDF had been uh, put up at several venues, it got plugged. Uh, I have a, a copy of it. Always, that's another little standard rule. If something appears at academia edu or research gate or whatever that is a relevant thing where you're going oh download it and save it so you have an archival copy because if somebody decides to pull the plug on it which they can uh then you you have it anyway and that way you can draw upon it and share it with people and make use of the information or non-information in it that you wouldn't if you say well it's on it's on academia edu it'll always be there right not necessarily so anyway um this little paper that he had done, and it wasn't terribly long. I, I seem to think it was like 11 pages. Or something. Um, Antediluvian Patriarch De Novo Mutation Rate, which um, isn't really all that accurate. He's trying to argue that you could identify a mutation rate that is just wonderfully constant and correct. For these patriarchs that live eight, nine hundred years, according to the Bible, and the science evidence supports all that, and it's a vomit of technical papers that really don't do that, <laughs> and uh, he doesn't seem to realize they don't do that, and you would have to look at the various technical papers involved. Well, uh, one of the big source examples um, that pops up in, in the, his piece and also Standing for Truth has made use of it and it's been fairly widely mangled. It pops up in Rupin Sanford's book. Uh, happens to be uh, uh, a uh, 1997 um, bit on um, high observed substitution rate in the human mitochondrial DNA control region, which has been misrepresented by a lot of people. Uh, what Parsons actually wrote uh, had to do with, um, uh, thus our observation of the substitution rate, 2.5 sites per million years is roughly 20 fold higher than would be predicted from phylogenetic analyses. Using our empirical rate to calibrate the mitochondrial DNA molecular clock would result in an age of the mtDNA MRCA 
uh, mitochondrial uh, RNA common ancestor of only 6,500 years. Ooh, close to the creation of the universe. You can see why that number got their interest. Clearly incompatible with the known age of modern humans. Even acknowledging that the MRCA of mitochondrial DNA may be younger than the MRCA of modern humans, it remains implausible to explain the known geographic distribution of mtDNA sequence variation by human migration that occurred only in the last 6,500 years. All of this then was a backhanded uh, indication that the number that they were coming for this anomalously high rate uh, was probably a fluke. That was because they were dealing with very narrow population mixes and particular genes that in a sample size that's small enough can pop up with the wrong value. And as we know, 1997 is a long time ago. And surprise, surprise, uh, the years since then have uh, only confirmed that, yeah, that value was not typical. And uh, there's another paper that I'll be putting a linkage up to. Um, uh, by Penny in 1995 that is on a, a similar related theme. Um, the point is, is that even this work was at best a curious question mark issue from 1997. And for anybody decades later to be drawing upon that as if it were cast in concrete and not bothering about how it was treated since then is just flap noodle. It's not a legitimate way to deal with anything. So, um, oh, Vandale, why was it there in the first place? What do we got in here? Oh, that's just, uh, I had my local bookstore move Nathan's book from the science section to the mythology section. They didn't have a pseudoscience section, yes. Uh, which uh, uh, which particular book was that? Best up, put that in the uh, the live chat there, um, so I can see which um, uh, what we're referring to. Let me see. And I don't have my main bibliography up. Um, da, 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 da. I'm always curious to see the uh, the background information. I think the person who initially stocked the book thought it was science. Well, that's not at all implausible. Um, I mean, what if you were to look at this book here, Replacing Darwin, The New Origin of Species, and it's got Charles Darwin is considered one of history's most influential books, and it's got background blurbs. Uh, from Kevin Anderson, PhD, microbiology, and uh, Rick Roberts, uh, PhD, biology program, and Andrew Fibich, professor of microbiology. Uh, and all of it looks perfectly normal unless you investigated who those people were and found out they're from Christian colleges and they're young earth creationists and so forth and so on. But there's nothing about that in here, nothing on the backgrounds of it. It looks just like you would think it's a science book. And that's Works that do that kind of um, fun and games, I find very reprehensible. Um, if you have a position, be honest, make it clear. And what's the what was the problem with Roop and Sanford's book? And in many respects, is the problem with this one, and was also the problem with Sanford's genetic entropy book. Is they've got a young Earth creationist axe to grind, but they don't reveal the axe. It's like um, the uh, here's Johnny uh, moment from uh, um, uh, The Shining, uh, except instead of using the axe to hammer through the door, he's got the axe in a little cart that's held by a string that goes back eight feet away from the door. Um, and ain't going to break through the door that way. And you need to be more open about what your actual position is because you need to be able to put forward your model in a way that is testable and follow through on the implications of that model rigorously. And if you're just kind of keeping it over in the corner, implying that you have this time frame when you haven't actually earned it, then uh, that's not a particularly valid uh, bit on it. Um, typically, the, the not creationist material, but intelligent design material will tend to get filed in the science section. So Michael Behe's book, Michael Denton's stuff will pop in there. And to be fair, uh, I'm not hypercritical on that. If they have, um, if they don't have a specialized section on it, if they, if they have enough material to consider mythology, it's other people's religions. 
So if you're in a Christian culture, you'll regard Hinduism as mythology and Greek gods as mythology. Uh, and are they going to be putting all the Bible healing stuff over in there? That's actually, technically speaking, uh, no, they, they want their own little subsection. So it all depends on how big the story is and how many subcategories they want. Uh, oh, we're buffering. Yeah, so that's another reason why I wanted to finish up uh, a lot of the advertisement material as, as much as I could. So that just in case we have a bit, I can't tell on my end what the screen is going on at your end. So as far as I can see, my picture is working fine. My voice is perfectly connected to it. Everything is just sweet cakes. Uh, so um, if it's not linking up properly, I'm not getting, I haven't gotten any notices that there's problem with the feed. So uh, I would have no, uh, no way of knowing it. Uh, I, I duly apologize to the video gods uh, if that's the case. And hopefully it will um, link up as long as it's, it's continuing. It should sync up again and all that. Uh, the, the meat and potatoes issues will be the material and the linkages, and that will be stuff that once the video is done and I can post the material on all of that, you can just go in and link it uh, and find the links for that. Well, one thing you should probably do, I do on my end, is to keep um, a listing of the actual URLs for the particular episode, or you can mark down what the particular episode is if you just are accessing the channel and running around to the menus that way. But any way that you can do to shortcut that, if there's a particular episode where you're going, oh, I want to know about that paper, just keep a copy of the URL, put it in a Word document or something like that, and then you can pull it up and link it in and zap directly to it. And after it's posted, then you can go down and find the technical links to papers that way. Those are the little shortcuts in that that I do. I have a long string of videos that um, I have plans to watch at some point. And I just triage them, one thing after another. I'll just store the uh, URL link. And then I can decide which one I want to go into. I often mark down uh, the date and particularly how long it is. So if I've got a thing where, oh, God, I'm going to have to sit through two hours of that, that's a different dynamic than a little 20-minute spiel. Uh, that will be a shorter fit thing to fiddle with. Um, the, the one that I'm dreading to do, which uh, eventually I'll have to get to, is to go through that long series, and I think it's like 20-some-odd episodes of the Answers in Genesis bit with Ken Ham and various creationists on their flood geology model. And it's a lot of it's just going to be reprising some of the material that's in the print version, but every once in a while you can find buried down in the hour and a half or so that these things rattle on. Um, some really stupid gaffes that people do when they're talking extemporaneously and they go overboard and they're going a little farther than their print material. Is. That's another reason why I like to go through these in some detail. Uh, oh, do, 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 where are your mods? Oh, um, not entirely sure what that means. Uh, moderators. Um, uh, again, I don't have an access on the restream to be able to establish moderators. Um, I'd have to have the YouTube version of it open, and then I would be able to get that. And I'm not sure yet whether I can plow along. I, I haven't experimented enough to where I don't know whether I can open it up through the live dashboard on YouTube and see that screen and whether or not that would have a connection fit. Uh, so I've been kind of just going on the, uh, let's not rattle our egg basket unless we absolutely have to. So I have now progressed to the stage where I can share an image on the screen. And so I can put up the commercials and I can do that aspect. And when I can also have invite somebody into the show and so on. So we'll proceed in accordingly. Um, the, um, the grand scheme of things, uh, of, it'll still take me quite a while to get down through the rest of the, um, um, Jensen's book, and then it'll be a matter of which one's next, and there's certainly a, an opportunity for various directions on that front. Uh, if anybody has any ideas on that, they can kind of keep knocking around in their uh, in their brain pan on it. Uh, my approach in dealing with particular subject matter has to do with how relevant it is for the topics that are going to be in the near-term projects. Uh, both the rocks were there and works beyond that. Um, and the laying, so there's an awful lot of groundwork laying down. In many cases, it's getting PDFs, and then I can have them stored. That means I got them. 
and then kind of keeping track of what all I have in there. Um, some things are more accessible than others, and you bear that in mind. Um, there's going to be some real juicy stuff on um, the geology end of it, uh, some of which was just literally dropped in my lap as a result of Nick Zentler's ongoing series on the uh, origin of the Cascade uh, Range in my neck of the woods, that there is some immensely complicated geology that's going on where fragments of rock that were formed hundreds of millions of years ago have been caught in subduction things and metamorphized and reconfigured and little fragments have been ending up, some of them up in British Columbia, and that is as sheer zones of pulled stuff apart. and um, it's um, uh, a, a fascinating mix that I think is inexplicable from a creationist point of view. Oveste asking, did anyone else see AIG latest video about why we have nasal bones? It's because of wearing glasses. Oh, dear. <laughs> wow. Yeah, those only go, glasses only go back until I think the Chinese invented them in the Middle Ages. And uh, then, of course, they got modified as you moved into Europe. Um, naturally, it was a direct connection to how well you could do glass grinding, lens making, um, and um, uh, that's comparatively recent. But I suppose if you're going to argue that the domestic banana was designed um, because it perfectly fits the hand, um, what else can you do? Uh, there, there, it's that. that um, I think we've had nasal bones long before glasses. One could just as easily argue that the ear was invented as a place to hold up the glass edge. See that? See how perfect that is? My glasses would fall off if they didn't have that ear back there. Wow. Um, that's uh, for those who don't know, Dr. Pangloss um, from uh, uh, Voltaire's Candide. Uh, and there's, he pops up also, I think, in the uh, Leonard Bernstein uh, operetta of Candide. And uh, uh, Dr. Pangloss was based in part on uh, uh, Karl Leibniz, the mathematician, who argued that this was the best of all possible worlds. That, that yeah, it looks crappy, but God could have made it even crappier. And uh, also the idea that your nose is perfectly shaped for your glasses, uh, that the puddle is exactly the right size for the water. Uh, all of that argument that, no, it's, the thing gets modified because it relates to the thing that exists and it has nothing to do with gods. And so that Panglossian approach, the best of all possible worlds, um, is uh, a thing that got parodied by Voltaire, who was prone to parody. So if you have a, a, a want to dive into the wonderful world of 18th century skeptics, uh, you can take a look at that. Uh, Candide uh, was considered quite an incendiary story. And Voltaire in general was. Uh, another one that was very incendiary was the um, uh, Figaro tales, uh, any of these things that were very sharp social commentary masquerading as comedy. And you've got the same thing with um, uh, uh, Lilliput uh, and uh, um, oh, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Swift, I think, um, that it's thought of as just fantastical tales, but in fact, it's a bitter, sharp satire on human social ills and prejudices. In fact, the version of the Gulliver's Travels that was done by, um, uh, oh, yipes, uh, Mary Steenburgen and her husband uh, from the NBC, The Good Place story, suddenly escaped my mind. Um, uh, they did a, a very effective version of that on, I think, NBC, and it's been a long time ago, 15, 20 years maybe. Uh, but they basically treated the whole story as what it was, which was a social commentary and deep criticism of the foibles of society, particularly the yahoos uh, the, and the talking horses and all of that, uh, that uh, upended our expectation. Um, so, Satire of that type has always been used as a way to throw you out of the current world and allow you to thumb your nose in a way with the fantastical. And in a more recent context, here we're waxing philosophical. Um, the Twilight Zone from uh, Rod Serling is exactly that same format, where instead of it being in a fantastic sense, 
about giants and uh, uh, weird tiny people and so forth. Uh, it's a science fiction typical context, but it's exactly the same kind of thing. It's social commentary. And so it's talking about racial prejudice. It's talking about bigotry. It's talking about decency and, and all of the human verities that couldn't necessarily be done and the commercial still staying attached on commercial television. Uh, Playhouse 90 and stuff was getting to be a little too risque politically in that people wouldn't accept it. Well, you just put it in science fiction and you can get those same ideas whoop, right, right into your head and you won't even bat an eyelash. Uh, Joe Science says, I would sell my soul, which I don't have to know what Georgia uh, was thinking when she heard her colleagues say that. Um, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> um, I don't think that Georgia Purdom thinks all that hard about a lot of the stuff that gets passed on in their arguments back and forth. They're in kind of a coffee clutch reinforcement mode. I know that that I've never seen an instance, if, if somebody has seen a spot where it looks like they've got a certain amount of like low look on their face, um, I don't know whether or not, I, I don't think any of these things are done live. That's one point. So I'm assuming that if there have been any uh, moments um that's been edited before the, the finished version is done uh somebody can let me know in fact if they if it's the case that that uh aig uh stuff is actually done live or whether it's pre-recorded uh this is i'm live i don't uh i did some early pre-recording stuff in the very beginning um and um i must say that once i discovered the capacity to have live feedback in the live chat i like that much better i love that interaction uh in a way that if you just put up a finished work that's pre-formatted yes you're having people uh, comment on it in the comment section but that's not quite the same as the live interaction uh, matter so uh, that's just me uh needless to say if i'd ever get um if uh, somebody connects up uh, with me that wants to do a more professional format where we would be sharing more of the things and graphics and all that kind of stuff um, at the kind of level that Apologia does. Um, I'm open to that. Um, that it's not my wheelhouse in terms of skill set. I'm the old fart that can just barely manage the screen share. So um, uh, it would be a, a future thing. I think it's done at least from what Paul Enns has said in the past. Uh, thank you, Vesta. Um, there's an awful lot of stuff that gets locked in the past. Oh, Brooke. Hi, Brooke. Hi, RJ. A long time no talk. I'm just stopping by to say hi. Well, I will s stop by to say hi to you saying hi to me. Yeah, don't don't be a complete stranger. And we miss you on, uh, we miss making fun of you uh, on uh, the Psy Strikes uh, movie nights and stuff with the Psy Strike link. Has continued on that tradition so yeah um keep it going and uh and um a brook was writing a fantasy adventure story i hope you haven't given that up you know you did a lot of work on that that's something that uh, you can use it just as i do my own writing as a wonderful escape valve to, from the world uh when you if you have worries or concerns about things um you can dive into that world and um um focus your attentions in a way that lets your brain cool down so all of the things that we're worried about that are now compartmentalized and now you're focusing on another thing now that too you can fret about as a worry oh how am i going to get that chapter done and all that but that too then can be put away for the night and you move back to the other project so it allows kind of a seesaw mentality there where you're never burned out on anything because you always have an option to go to another thing for them. So it, uh, um, uh, I will then focus on a particular thing. So work on the second Paralogs of Fog novel uh, went on to more of a siding. I didn't stop, but nonetheless went on more of a siding while uh, Jackson and I were doing the rocks were there. And then once that's out of the way, then I gear shifted and now a lot of my primary focus is on finishing off that second book. And once that's out of the way, then I'll be able to devote my intention more focused on Rocks Volume 2, while planning out, planning for the third Phileas Fog novel, which once the Rocks Volume 2 is done, then I can shift over to that and boom, 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 down the line. Um, 
And so it means that so long as I keep healthy and active, I got no shortage of things to do to keep me busy, uh, which is more than can be said for. Uh, I, 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 the one thing I do feel sorry for would be anybody who doesn't have that uh, kind of outlet to work with. Imagine sitting like President Trump does, screaming at the t multiple picture screens that they're looking at. Oh, CNN is saying this and the Fox News is not. What a waste of time. And that there, there's so much information, there's so many wonderful things. I love doing research, both for the science uh, works and for the uh, uh, fiction stuff, because they're all bumping into things. I'm researching the history of science processes and the history of particular places that I'm using as, as the staging locations for the storyline. And it's just delightful. Uh, it, it keeps me going. And, oh, Brooke, thank you. Yeah, she's trying to work on it. Got some progress done in chapter two. Um, uh, we had some little Zoom meetings uh, back in the day. I think it's like a year or two ago uh, on some of the tricks that I made use of in my own writing. And the one thing that I, I gave Brooke uh, that I would give to anybody on there, if you're writing fiction, is any dialogue you write, read it aloud. If you can't speak the dialogue, don't expect it to ring true somebody reading it and get the pacings for writing dialogue in the way people actually talk. So when I'm writing out dialogue uh, for Phileas Fogg or Aouda or Passepartout or Thomasina Maker, I have to know who's going to say the line because they don't all talk alike. The point I want to get across would be said differently by each one of those people. Uh, I once suggested to Brooke one of the tricks you use is when, before you even getting into writing the story, try imagining your main character sitting down and playing a game of Monopoly. And think about how they would do that. And if you can get to the point where you have a sense about how they would do that or how they would handle themselves at a dinner table, um, cleaning up after Thanksgiving, uh, that will mean that you now have their their characters in your head. And you can work out them as human beings, not as plot placeholders, which is probably the various uh, a part of that. Uh, yeah, oh, oh uh, Brooks said that um, uh, moved to KSU and now in Topeka working for the state. Oh, okay. Hope all is working out well. Kansas is a up in the air state on so many things. I know that they've had uh, some troubles over um, the climate-induced uh, uh, crop issues, and now, of course, also the, uh, I think they grow soybeans and other stuff in Kansas, and that stuff was hit by the tariffs and that, so uh, life is um, interesting, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, uh, so that, is, that was the little sidebar on the, uh, the fiction thing, that you can use it as part therapy and uh, also part researching mode. Um, so many opportunities to learn stuff, um, the, um, uh, let's see, we're on 748. Yes. Um, as a generic issue about researching capabilities, we've got so many capacities for things. If you are, um, uh, like me, uh, and you see a document that you get on a website, it's in HTML format. And you might find that if you just go hit print, you're going to get like 40 pages of which a pile of it is just links and ads and crap that you don't really need. All you needed was that little blippy text. Um, and you just wasted a bunch of paper and ink and that costs money. Might I recommend the cheat that I use, which is I keep doc files and I will highlight the text I want to retain and copy that into a doc file. And then often there will be side links and stuff that I don't need, and I can edit those out. Ooh, and I trim it down to where I've only got the text I need. And then I can save that. And if I need to print it out, find it handy, but at least I've got it separate. And uh, if you can access a PDF or some other document, but very few of the stuff that you're going to find as web pages are going to be available in PDF format. Uh, it's not like technical literature or scholarly works. So that cheat of being able to get the information saved. Sometimes the pesky parts come from pictures where you may find that even though you've copied the bloody thing, it isn't showing up in pictures because there are things with hyperlinks and stuff and it's all you get is a little box that has absolutely nothing on it. Uh, that can be frustrating. Uh, but uh, it's, it's one ways to, to maneuver around the thing 
and to be able to, to triage your information to avoid having to have piles of paper that aren't helping you on anything. Uh, Vesta says, it's too many darn hobbies to keep you busy and owning a small business fills my days and COVID has given me 1.5 to 2 hours spare time. Exactly. Yes, uh, one advantage of old fartism retiree is that I don't have those worries about. I'm not um, having to worry about whether or not I'm going to be laid off from a job uh, or whether there will be a job to get back to after everything is all done. Um, that this hit when I was already in retirement and on Social Security and on Medicare uh, meant that there were things that I didn't have to bother about in terms of plugging holes uh, that I could just proceed accordingly. And all I have to do is to maintain um, the um, monthly bills and the occasional unexpected like garage door repairs or um, the car servicing and things like that that can bump up uh, circumstances. Um, so far, at least, Washington State has stayed pretty much on a lot of commerce still operating. You wear masks, you have social distancing and all of that. They're cutting back on uh, in-restaurant dining uh, because of the sudden surge of things. Other states haven't even gotten to that point. And over to Idaho, they were acting like everything was just fine and normal. And now they're reaping the whirlwind. And... Um, uh, how many of those places that are going to be popping up in Coeur d'Alene are going to have to zip over to the hospitals in Spokane that are stressed because of the upsurge? Uh, where we are a big medical center over here, we got a lot of major hospitals over here, but they don't have a limitless amount of beds. So um, uh, we keep monitoring on that. There were apparently a bunch of political nincompoops uh, in the health office, there were political appointees, and they were they just fired this the medical doctor for reasons that are extremely murky. And it sounds like it's because he was saying, "Excuse me, you need to wear masks," and they didn't like that. And there's a group of hyper conservatives over in our neck of the woods that scream bloody murder about you're infringing on our rights. Well, excuse me, your rights don't extend to your spewing COVID virus in your spittle into the air. At that point, no, I'm afraid not. If you were on fire and you say, well, I have a perfect right to walk around while I'm on fire and set fire to your house. Uh, no, that doesn't work that way. And um, uh, it tells you an awful lot about how some people think of the world. Uh, whereas reasonable people, you know, is it the skin off your nose to wear the damn mask? For one thing, we don't have to look at your mug. I think everyone would be happy not to have to see my face. So uh, the masks help on there. Uh, Brooke says, out here, the local hospital had to bring in a mobile morgue for the COVID test. That's, yeah, that, there are a lot of places where they are in a stress mode where they have to set up mobile hospitals. And um, uh, that can happen in a hurry. Some places, rural areas are far more stressed than big cities, and they, they don't realize it because they don't have any medical facilities there. So what happens if you really get sick? You have to schlep 50 miles to the county seat to find the, the medical facility that can take care of you. And by the time you get there, you find there ain't no beds because they're all filled up from everywhere else. That's the situation that you can get into in a hurry on this. Uh, Ovestus has done considerable work on N-scale train layout, added an entire island of my layout, took a U-shaped layout to an E-shaped layout. Yeah, there's a, I've, I've always adored model trains and things models in general. Uh, but I didn't have the patience or space to deal with a lot of them. Obviously, the smaller the gauge you use, the more uh, intricate and stuff you deal with. And I, I've always adored um, the, the diorama detail model work that you can get into at any of the scales. And there are various um, museums and train collections in that around the country uh, that, that are like the holy grail of places to visit that do those sorts of things. In, in the amusement park that I fantasized about in my head, there would have been a whole huge roundhouse thing that would be a mass of railroad displays, just like that, in varying gauges, and uh, that would be just like the, uh, that anybody that's in the model trains would just go berserk uh, to be able to see, some of which would be rotating displays and others would be permanent ones. <clears throat> uh, Burke also says, school that was closed for the year was turned into a makeshift hospital as well. I made use, by uh, way on that model issue, I made use of models um, uh, for my own writing purposes. Um, the Great Eastern that figures in the uh, Paralogues of Phileas Fogg, I built a model of that 
um, back in 1970, late 60s, somewhere around in there. And I'm not even sure whether the model is still available. It's a pretty good size thing, it's about yay long. Um, and uh, I always adored the Great Eastern as a ship. And um, it nagged in my head. And when I needed a neat little place for the villains to be using as their floating base of operations in the Paralogs of Pog Bobble, I thought, heck, the Great Eastern. No one's used it as a stage prop in, in a story. Um, Jules Verne wrote a, a rather sappy love story on it when he came to America in 1867 and, and didn't even describe much about the ship. So um, that was kind of a waste of it. So I, 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 I made use of that. Anybody that's into ocean liners, um, they, uh, if you get the Paralogs of Phileas Fogg, you'll have an, a bunch of interesting stuff that takes place aboard the Great Easter. And if and when I eventually maybe get a regular publisher to pick up the series, uh, it'd be fun to do illustrated versions because there are actual photographs and things of the interior of the Great Eastern that connect up. I love to have those visualizations. Uh, so I was a big ocean liner buff. Um, the Paralogs of Fog will never really get too much into the era of avi aviation. Uh, that was another area that I studied in other areas. And of course, automobiles, that's another area that I was. So um, um, it, it's, a, it's a fun, vicarious way to investigate stuff um in a lot of different owns um anybody got any questions for the old fart rj there before we uh, uh shut down the show on there uh oh um Vesta says uh, uh, a model 1940 1950 time frame steam to early diesel transitions uh, the one little thing that i if i'd been fabulously rich the one thing that i missed and i even saw one still available in a vintage toy store over in Seattle, and this was maybe 10 or 15 years ago. But in the early 1960s, when they put the monorail in Disneyland, they even had a monorail set you could buy. So it was up on its little pylons, and you had the little monorail that went around and all that. And it was a pretty good looking model, too, but it was quite pricey. I seem to think it was something in the neighborhood of like $85 or something like that in the 1960s. It was pricey. And it was even more. I'm, I seem to think it was in the multiple hundred dollars range uh, for that little model kit, uh, the, the monorail set uh, in that place over in Seattle. Um, I don't despair at not having got it, but it was it was a funky little thing, and it was a cute little thing to think about. Um, oh, Brookcast is still up looking over my book, and I finished chapter two. Absolutely, you have my email, so you have ways of contacting me on that, and I will be um, as usual critical. Um, the main thing is, is, is the, you think through where you want the plot to go and how much do you want to be improvisational at a particular moment? In it? How much do you want to keep on to a structure? Uh, if you are dealing with storyline that has suspense elements, which yours does, then you want to figure how you want to reveal things in natural format so that the reader is exposed to it and yet not telegraphing, important point, important point. And that's one of the subtlest and ingenious uh, things. And part of the way you learn that skill is by studying how other people do it. So in uh, print, you have Agatha Christie. And in films, you see how mysteries are done to see how clue points can be presented in such a way that they can be um, ingeniously structured. And uh, it's just a skill that you learn over time. Uh, that's the way it works out. So uh, we're coming up on the hour there. Uh, the um, 40, 50 time frame was uh, on steam to early diesel is a point just before I was born. And my mother, who was a train junkie, because she grew up with them and her dream, if she had had the opportunity, she would have liked to have been an engineer. But women couldn't do that in those days. She would just love to toot the thing and uh, drive the train. Um, the the age of the steam engine was deteriorating and everything was converting over into diesel in that period right after World War II, when everybody was going by train uh, and everything was run in the military and you didn't have gas for cars. Um, there was a bit of a network of highways and motels that had pre-existed World War II, uh, but it started to really kick in after the war. And the world of the train that seemed so bright uh, quickly deteriorated as the car took over as the primary 
personal transport device and, and planes between the planes and uh, and automobiles where you have now a vast internet of uh, interlocking network of interstate highway systems and motels and the like and hotels and the cars were a better and better reliability for long distance travel the tires were better they didn't blow out as frequently uh and you had triple a and you had all the different networks that made it easier and easier to travel uh that cut down on train travel and uh, aircraft uh, was gradually obliterating the long distance haul. So why, if you were gonna take a train from Los Angeles to New York, that's a laborious thing compared to flying. And all of that just, just deteriorated it. So you can see the train was still a romantic, glorious thing in North by Northwest, the Hitchcock movie from 1959. But by 1969, and 79 and 89, it was increasingly uh, falling apart. And eventually uh, all of the standard railroad companies stopped having independent passenger lines. Amtrak uh, uh, eventually was picked up. There's an awful lot of hyper-conservative Republicans who can't stand Amtrak and been trying to kill it for years. My mother, who was a train buff, would uh, uh, even wrote a letter to the head of Amtrak at the time who met her in uh she it was a joy of her life when she got a, a cap from him uh when he was still in charge of amtrak uh in the uh the early 2000s and uh of her love for trains and uh that was a thing that um uh, there is a, a romance and a delight in railroads uh the orient express type super elegant dinner train things all of that is a relatively recent phenomenon because it came about as a result of the murder on the orient express movie so um things can change. You still have um, high-speed rail line dreams, but the problem is in the United States, a lot of tracks aren't capable of handling them. So the Acela seldom can ever run at full speed because they are, the tracks are designed for those slow, clunky um, uh, freight lines. And I, for one, would advocate nationalizing the rail bed and running it like the interstate highway system to upgrade to these sort of things. But that's the thing that, try getting that through, uh, a bunch of Republicans. So, uh, I guess I would say well, one of the steam engines that I have is called the City of Vancouver. Steam engine that my maternal grandfather was an engineer on that. Um, it, it, if you can remember how many wheels it's got on it, that would be something that's, um, I'm, I don't know whether Canada uses the same nomenclature as Britain. Uh, they, they list everything by the, the, the number of wheels on one side. So you might find a, a car that's listed as a 240 um 242 uh, two, which you mean there's two wheels in front of the drive wheels and four drive wheels and then two underneath the drive carriage whereas i think the um um either the british or the americans then have a different nomenclature where they list all of the wheels so that would be uh, a uh, uh yeah i think the british use only the one half side so it would be a one a, a one four oh uh, 141, if there's only one set of wheels behind, whereas a, a, an American would call it a, um, uh, uh, a, a 282. And um, pure nomenclature a little bit. Anyway, I digress. And we are now past the hour, and uh, RJ is going into a railroad minutiae here, and sh should probably zip it on. So thank you very much for those who found the channel again, and everybody stay safe. Uh, it looks like if you um, you'll probably want to be not run into places for thanksgiving uh, some of them say well if you're going to have your thanksgiving meal have it outside well that rules out any place that's cold nobody in in, in the pacific northwest is going to want to have a christmas a thanksgiving dinner outside thank you very much that ain't gonna work so it looks like there's an awful lot of families around that are going to be burning up the zoom channels uh during thanksgiving and that will be something to parent bear in mind you might want to stagger what hours you get on to do a zoom meeting to make sure that you can stay online and not have uh, uh the um, the lines borne up so anyway more things to think about uh stay safe um wear masks um uh, it's uh, better to have a zoom thanksgiving than an icu christmas as someone on twitter just noted today and i think that's valid so thank you very much uh shutting down for the night and we will see you next week. And